Okay. A uh, couple, couple quick um, things that I want uh, to chat about um, before Kern gets here. Um, one is a reminder about our in-person event today. That will be from 8.30, I'm sorry, that will be from 2.30 uh, to 3.30. And what I have in mind is um, uh, some in-person um, script practice and role play just to kind of get everyone back into the office and uh, you know, give everyone an opportunity to meet each other, meet each other again, and then do some in-person uh, work together. Candace, everything okay with Kern? Yep, she's jumping on in a second. Okay, beautiful, thank you. Um, the other thing I wanna remind you of is, I gotta be honest, I don't say this very often, but the session yesterday with Ray Wayne about building a powerful team was incredible, incredible. It was, um, for those that don't know, Ray was essentially the, in the couple of years leading up to the release of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, Ray was Keller Williams' top agent or top team. And she was a millionaire real estate agent really before there was such a thing. And she was being personally recruited and then personally coached by, Car by Gary. Um, the, just the way she thinks about business and the way she thinks about growth and hiring and all that stuff is amazing. Um, so I don't say that lightly. If I would highly encourage you guys to, um, uh, to participate in the class on Thursday. And when the recording comes back for yesterday, I'll share that with the group because it is absolutely worth a listen. Um, just from a business mindset standpoint, I think that's um, really, really, really important that you that you take uh, a few hours to listen to that. Um, the other thing I want to remind you of is there will be no huddle on Friday. Um, we'll have the week at a glance sent out a little bit later. Uh, this week, um, I'll be traveling on Friday for, or really, I'll be traveling on Thursday for, to go down to Orlando for a family reunion. Um, and so I'm going to encourage everyone to participate in the, uh, the activities at the office. You can watch the vision speech and you know, the, the state of the company and all that kind of stuff. Um, Candace, am I missing any kind of clerical things? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Okay, um, let's, uh, while we wait for Kern, does anyone wanna share any any positive news? Any, any cool things that have happened to them uh, over the last few days in their real estate business? Any uh, great appointments, any, um, Kind of moments on the phone where you're feeling like you're having a breakthrough or with customers anybody sign any contracts they want to share some details about i'll share bill okay beautiful yesterday i had a um a lunch date with one of my previous residents and uh we had a really good discussion about real estate and um he was able to call shelter about to get pre-approved he also sent me a referral for a listing that i talked to um, that want to list the end of March. <laughs> and then I got a referral from someone from Savannah for a buyer. So yesterday was a good day. <laughs> well, and you got a, you got a little, um, uh, you got a chance to share your story a bit, right? Yes. That was also awesome as well too. Um, yeah, different agents contact, contacted me. So yeah, yesterday was a, a awesome day. Yeah. And, I uh, I just wanted everyone to, to, you know, at the end of the night, I don't know if you guys heard this, but, uh, or saw this, but, um, uh, Mar Marquia posted something to the effect of, you know, follow me, I'll follow you, let's support each other, and these kind of things on the WhatsApp chat. Guys, that's leadership right there. That's that's impressive. That's um, when you when you win, um, you 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 share your. There are no secrets, right? You just you share your experiences, and um, and that's that's one piece of you know that's super important. But what's even more impressive is um, your desire to. Uh, to help others that are um, maybe a step or two back from where you are and uh, are, are looking at you as a, as a role model. And I'm just, I was just so proud to be sitting in that room yesterday um, with, with you. So thank you for, for all of your hard, hard effort. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have we learned anything about Kern? She said she was grabbing. She said she was grabbing the link and was going to um, uh, jump in. So, 
I'll just I'll just text her right quick and resend it to her. Um, so in case she's having trouble look, locating the email. Okay, beautiful. Who else wants to share some news? Anyone have any bad news? Anyone got themselves in a situation that they were unsure how to get out of it? Did anyone um, get stumped yesterday or the day before? Come on, give me something to talk about. Anyone got any jokes? <laughs> got a smile out of Tracy and Lorinda. Okay. What did you guys hear when at uh, what did you guys hear from Marquia yesterday? What, what were some of the themes you heard? Focus and tenacity. Yep. Commitment. Commitment for what? What was that? What commitment for what? What was her commitment, you think? She was commit she was committed to um real estate full time. She was committed to getting through her full-time JLB and um, committed to leaving it, committed to being um, just committed. She was committed to her, what she wanted. <laughs> That's right. I mean, she woke up early every day, went and took care of her body, right? Mm -hmm. And then she, and she took care of her mind and then she just went to work, right? And she was constantly looking at how can I get better at real estate while fulfilling my obligations at my other work? Mm -hmm. Right. What else did you hear? <clears throat> I want to share. I want to share what I heard because that was a very inspiring story of how when we decide that we're going to make something possible, we can make it possible. And obviously she decided to have some goals and she will not negotiate with herself. That's what I heard. She was going to achieve it and she did. I absolutely loved how she chose the best venue for herself. She leveraged everything she could to get to her goal. And once she got there, she switched around that practice again. And, uh, and we can see her success. So that commitment to herself first and to her goals was just inspiring. And I, I just absolutely loved listening to that. It's an awesome uh, <clears throat> testimony of, of what it means to really commit as, as you guys say. You know, I found it was really, um, thank you for sharing that. I, I, found, I found it was really interesting that I would say the vast majority of people that make that transition from dual career to, to, to full time, they don't, <laughs> they don't have an assistant in, 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 the, meet, in the midst of it all, right? Yeah. And I think that was really um, eye-opening. It's yeah. that there's, lot, there's lots of things to get done and you may or may not have um, all of the uh, time. You probably don't have time to do it all. So the question mm -hmm. is, is who can help you with all these tasks that gotta get done, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might have said, Oh well, I can't afford a VA, and I can't afford and I can't afford to use the time to go take care of my body. And then they wouldn't have gone to the, the gym, they wouldn't have hired a VA, and they'd still be dual career. Right? Yeah, there's a there's a go great ahead. book called Who Not How, and Marquia went and found her who's, and um, that's that's the point of the book. So great book to read, and Marquia just exemplified it. Love that. Love that. Um, there's all. a video that I, uh, it was an interview with the guy that wrote um, Who Not How on Bigger Pockets. I'll post that podcast, um, or it's actually a video. I think it, they made it into a podcast, but I have a version of it with video. It's phenomenal. Just the way this guy thinks is just so incredible. Marquia, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, no, Oops. I think more than anything, just um, dedication is definitely um, the key keyword and just um, sticking to what you want and, and how to execute it your way. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for, for doing all that you do. Welcome, Kern. <laughs> hey, good morning. Good morning. Okay, I have made you a co-host. Um, I've actually made both of your names co -host. Yeah, sorry, I'm having some technical problems this morning. <laughs> That's okay. I, my car won't start and that rearranges my entire day. So um, we're all just smiling and moving yeah, on, yeah. right? I think, I think because I'm logged in, you know, we have all this security on our um, 
on our office. And so since I'm logged in through the office so that I can pop up a HUD for y'all, it won't let me um, use the audio this morning. Okay, well, I've let, why don't you try to share a screen, make sure we've got that part figured out. And um, then we will turn over the floor to you and you can teach us all about uh, the settlement statement. Okay. If not, Kern, you can send it to me if you can, and I'll pop it up. Can yeah. you see that? Not yet. All right, hold on. Let me try one more thing. Oh, here we go. I have to select the document. All right, here we go. All right. All right, beautiful. Can everyone see? Everybody see that? I, I, I yes. love this. Uh, yes. I always get nervous when people share things like this um, because I don't want you know any personal or private information to be on there. But I have a feeling that there is no such thing as one, two, three, four, dream court. And Jane, uh, happy buyer. I love yes, that. yes. So I'm, I'm pulling this one up first because this is the this is the old HUD. OK, so this is what we use in cash transactions. Um, so you'll see you'll see really three different settlement statements at closing. Um, you'll see the old HUD one, which is what we used to have to use. It's called the HUD one because it's it's Department of HUD's number one form. Um, and we still use it in cash. It still has loan amounts and all that. So if it's private financing, seller financing, this is the form that we use. Um, and then there's a master settlement statement, which is what you, we use at O'Kelly. Um, and that's for uh, the buyer getting a loan. Um, and then you also see an Alta settlement statement. We do not use the Alta. Some firms do. I just think it's a little bit more difficult to read. Um, than the yeah, I love one. how uh, back then they said that we're coming out with this so it's easier to understand. And I thought it was five times more difficult to understand. Um, yes. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like technology, right? This morning, sometimes it just makes it even, even more difficult. Okay, if I pull this up, let me. All right, let me just say, say one thing before you get, <clears throat> get into, into this, which is this document should be sent out to um, all the parties, uh, generally within a couple of days of closing. And it is your responsibility as an agent on either side to make certain that your client understands this and that it's correct, right? So uh, Kern, when you're explaining everything, maybe you can highlight some of the things that um, are, um, the, the agent in particular should be looking, looking at. Um, those things in my eyes would be things like, um, you know, is the home warranty being paid for? Um, are the number of days of interest correct? Are they collecting for the HOA fees? Um, you know, are the commissions correct? These kind of things. I'm sure you'll walk us through all of that. Um, but you don't just let the buyer, you know, just say, hey, here's the form, see it closing. Like what I would always do is say, do you want to review this together? Or have you had a chance to review this with your lender line by line? Right. The closing right. attorney, of course, will do it at closing, but I don't want there to be any surprises at closing. And I also don't want um, I, I want the person walking in there with a lot of confidence where they're not nervous. I mean, they're going to probably have a little bit of anxiety, but the more they understand about the numbers and what's expected of them, the better prepared they'll be and the more relaxed they'll be. And I also think um, it makes the, the closing attorneys happier because they don't have to go redo 50,000 pieces of paper and um, which ties up their time. So it's a, it just makes it seamless for everybody to catch those things ahead of time. Correct. We're not seeing your, your share anymore, Kurt. All right, hold on. I'm trying to switch documents. So that you can see. I'm going to close that one out.
So I guess my point for that was don't, don't, don't just think that this is a form that but lawyers use and you don't have to worry about it, right? Your, your right. job is to help um, to understand it completely yourself as well as um, making sure that your particular client looks at it. And, and yes, is familiar yes. With so it. I can't share the master settlement statement for some reason. It's not, I'm trying one more time, but um, let me tell you just kind of what happens too. So when we have approval from the lender, to, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, when we have approval from the lender on this, on the um, numbers, we'll send out the settlement statement and that'll come to you first as the agent. Um, and Monica, she's my closer. She sends it out and she says, Hey, let me know if you have any changes. Right. And for your first few deals, that's, that's when you're probably going to want to call me. I'm happy to go over it with you um, line by line so that when your client sees it, they know they've already seen the, the closing disclosure. So typically that's when they're asking questions of their lender. Um, but you want to make sure your role, like Bill said, is to make sure, you know, there's a home warranty on there. Your commission is correct. Um, that any kind of um, concession um, that's on there, we're not seeing a lot of seller concessions, but any kind of concession that's on there um, is correctly reflected on the HUD. Because if we don't right, have like a good example of that would be like, let's say the, the seller agreed to pay like, a, let's say an electrician a couple hundred bucks or something like that then it needs to be reflected off of the, or on the settlement statement itself. Correct. Or in, ter or in terms of like a temporary occupancy where there's uh, money held back in escrow uh, to make sure the property is in great condition when the buyer moves in, the seller's, part of the seller's proceeds are held back in escrow, those kinds of things. Um, yes, yes. Um, and, and I'm going to be teaching very soon. I did the legal descriptions, but I'm, I'm going to be teaching a lot of classes this spring on, um, you know, sort of intro level things for you all um, that are newer. And, and I do a mock closing. We actually go over the settlement statement in that class. I go through the whole closing, what you can expect, um, what everybody's going to sign, and, and all of that. So you, we can see it, you know, in in great detail, but I, the, the two biggest thing mistakes that I see um, that agents make um, is they don't send amendments to the lender and to us. Um, so even if it's down to the, you know, down to the wire, it's the walkthrough, it's the day before closing, call us and let us know, hey, we've done an amendment because we want to we want to get that over to the lender to change our numbers or um, they're not looking at the settlement statement. And I see this really not so much with new agents because um, y'all are looking at everything closely. It's when you get a, a higher level of production, um, you maybe have a couple closings going on that week um, and they're not really looking at it until right before the closing. Um, and we wanna have changes because any, any change that we have, even on the seller side, it's gotta go back to the lender um, and they've mm -hmm. gotta approve that and send us a new closing disclosure. Um, even though we can generate those numbers on the settlement statement, they have to generate that closing disclosure. So if we can do that at least the day before closing um, so that when y'all walk into my office, it's all ready to go, that's what's ideal. So Kern, how does that affect the three-day rule? For the uh, well, you can have change it. They just have to disclose. So a lot of times it, it varies lender to lender. So I'll tell you like shelter, what shelter does um, is they send us, when they are ready to go, they send us a closing disclosure, and then we, we what we call match that, okay? So the lender's not going to have the tax prorations on there. They're not going to have HOA fees. That all comes from us. They send us their figures. We, we, we match those, and we send them everything else, um, and then they approve our settlement statement, and we send it out. If sometimes, if we're waiting on something, you know, the the HOA letter is down to the wire. The lender may go ahead and disclose, but they can. There's there's numbers that can change, and HOA is a good example of that. Um, tax prorations are a good example of that. Um, escrow amounts those may those may change. So ideally, you know, with shelter, they like to send it out and not you know have it and have it already be final at that phase. Um, but 
a lot of lenders will disclose and then they have not even sent us numbers yet. So what they disclose is going to change in those three days before the closing. Right. The, the idea there is so the consumer, the borrower um, has more and more information ahead of, you know, because the, if the if the buyer doesn't have an, an idea of what's going on and they're, they've already got anxiety around the purchase and moving in and the moving truck and the kids running around and like there's just a lot of exterior things that are happening and the more they can know about the actual closing numbers and closing documents, the more comfortable they're going to feel and the more relaxed they're going to be, right? Right. So, and, and they may feel like <clears throat> perhaps a little bit of pressure at the closing table because everyone's sitting there watching them because they're the star of the show and they might feel apprehensive to ask questions that they really want to ask, right? So you just want that buyer walking in knowing everything and say, where do I sign? I'm cool. Right, right. And, and, and really, you know, other than a, a few of the documents the note, the security deed, most of what they sign at closing, they've already seen, they've already signed. They sign it electronically. Um, so they're really now, it's different than when I bought my first house. Um, the buyers are really prepared once they get there. You know, I walked into the closing, my interest rate was wrong on the on the note. That doesn't happen now um, because yeah. of that. Because I was gonna that. say that was a, must've been a long time ago. Yep. <laughs> Kern, I have an Alta pulled up and I've hidden the names of the uh, by the seller and the buyer. If you want me to share screen uh, hang, so you can talk about Yeah, that'd that. be great. Thanks, Candace. Uh, hang on, let me make you a co-host. Okay. All right, you're a co-host. Okay. I've never had three co-hosts before. <laughs> All right, can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. uh, blow it up a little bit more if you don't mind. I'm not sure I can. It's in this, it's in like a, Wait, let me see. Here we go. Yeah, exactly. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So you see, you see, there's a buyer side, buyers on the right hand column, um, the sellers in the left. And on each one, it's a debit credit situation. Okay. So in the buyer column, the debits, that's, that's everything that the buyer is going to owe. And then the credit column is going to bring that down. So your sales price on this one's three hundred thousand. The deposit—that's the earnest money of twenty five hundred, um, and then the loan amount's two seventy, and then a credit. So the agent's given a credit of commission on this one of twenty five hundred, and then the next section are any prorations for um, HOA and taxes. So that depends on whether or not the the buyer owes something. There depends on the time of year that they close. Um, for property taxes. So if they're closing now, the, the, that's going to actually, like it is here, be a credit um, to the buyer because the tax bill is not out yet. So the seller is going to give a credit for their share of the year, and then the buyer is going to pay the bill when it comes out in the fall. Does everyone um, understand that? Is there anybody who's unclear about how that works? That can be a little confusing sometimes. Yes, it is. It is confusing because I always just have to think about it as is the bill out. Um, if the bill's out, the seller's going to pay it and the buyer's going to pay their portion, um, credit their portion to the seller. But if the bill's not out yet, um, the seller's going to credit the buyer. And with HOA here, so you see it's a debit. So it's a charge to the buyer. Um, and that's because the seller's already paid the HOA for the year. So that generally happens, um, uh, like if you're in a condo or something, condo or townhomes, the generally the HOA payments are due once a month, right? But if you're in a right. single family home, that's like, let's say like a swim and tennis or something, uh, and let's say the swim and tennis is $800 a year, generally it's either due once a year or they split it up twice a year. Um, and that, that varies community to community. So um, depending on whether the seller has already paid, uh, a portion of that, then it's all prorated back. Essentially what happens is the seller pays the prorated share of that debt or that, that obligation for all the days that they were the owner of the property and the buyer will ultimately pay it for all the days that they're the owner of the property. Correct, correct. Um, and and y'all don't have to worry about HOA fees, okay? Because I have a lot of buyers um, and buyers agents that get worried about that. Is there going to be a lien? No, we check all that. 
um, that's that's why we have to get that letter from the HOA. So we'll make sure if there's anything outstanding the seller owes that we collect it from the seller at closing. Um, and then your loan charges section. So you know that's ever that's all your lender charges, processing fees, um, that kind of thing, prepaid interest. Um, so the interest is paid in arrears. Um, so they will pay through to the end of the month that they're closing and prepaid interest. And then they, they'll, they won't make a payment. Like if you're closing now in February, you're not gonna make a March payment. You're gonna make an April 1st payment because that's gonna pay March's interest. So you have to pay the February interest at closing. And then the- right, Does everyone understand that? Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah. Huh? It's are, not like rent. So rent's paid in advance and mortgage interest is paid in arrear. And I'll, so, I'll just say a lot of times um, agents like to close toward the end of the month because the interest is very minimal. You can see here it's one day of interest and then they have a whole month before they um, before they have a payment. So that's that's why a lot of times when you see the numbers go up in the in the um, market stats in the team meeting and there's a lot of closings toward the end of the month. Um, that's why. Yes. One of the reasons why. Right. Yes. It, it, in effect, it effectually lowers the closing cost. Yeah. But there are no tricks. Every day that you own right. the home, you'll be paying for owning the home. Exactly. <laughs> um, correct. So any any lender charges, that's what comes on the CD to us, um, is all their charges. And then their escrows. So they set that up based on when those taxes are due. Um so let's say, you know, they're due in, um, they're due in October, right? And they're not going to pay until April 1st. So they'll have April, May, June, July, August, September. Um, so that's six months. So they have to, they have to collect enough in that escrow to make sure there's 12 months when that bill comes out. Um, so that's where they get those figures um, for. So, and then they can have a two month cushion. So here, see it says property taxes, 196.56 per month for eight months. Um, so that, that's how they get those. And then the aggregate adjustment, that it's, it's sort of a complex thing. It kind of made, took me a while to understand this, but they collect the money in there, but they can only have a two month cushion in the escrow account. So two months worth of your payments for your taxes and your insurance. So once they collect that money in that account, they look at it and say, okay, we've got too much money. And so they do an aggregate adjustment. And, and that's why that is. Uh, Oops. Oops. Ah, sorry, I have, squirrel, I have a squirrely mouse, there we go. So, and then at, then at the bottom, um, recording fees. So now they used to charge per page, um, but now it's $25 a document. Plus if it's in uh, electronic recording county, um, which most Metro counties are, it's 475 for each document um, that, we, that we have to record. Mm -hmm. And intangibles tax, you'll only see this where they're getting a loan um, and that, the rough calculation on that is three dollars a thousand on um, on the loan amount. So if you have a hundred thousand dollar loan, you're paying three hundred dollars in intangibles tax. Um, and the transfer tax, the buyer pays that under the GAR contract, and that is a dollar per thousand on your sales price. So here, the sales price is three hundred thousand. So the transfer tax mm -hmm. is three hundred dollars and that's every transaction cash um, or a loan so if you ask me you know for an estimate on closing costs um, for a cash buyer I include that um, I include that amount in my estimate that I'll send you okay I'm just going to stop share so I can make sure I'm not revealing anything on the next page and then I'll get it back okay any questions any so far okay we're good there we go Okay, um, and then title charges. Okay, so these are these these are your title. I must say, I am so pleased that the reduction in commission did not come from Keller Williams' side. Would never be <laughs> me, Bill. Would never be me. 
and figure out something else. Yeah, so title, title charges, uh, a closing protection letter, the lenders require that. And that mm -hmm. just is a letter that says, hey, based, a lot of different things, but like if I embezzled the money, they would still insure the transaction. Um, that's protection for the lender and they require that. And it, this one's 45, it's usually 45 to $50 in that, in that range. Um, and then the title policy um, charges, the um, this one's old old republic and that that depends on the loan amount and the owner's policy same thing it depends on um, it depends on the purchase price and then it then those the difference between what you pay for the lender's policy and what you pay for the owner's policy depends on depends on the amount of the loan um, but essentially if your buyer is getting a loan because they, they get a special reduced overall rate, really. Um, it costs them $150 more than what it would cost them if they were paying cash and getting an owner's policy. Um, if Meaning they, there's a little bit of a break in pricing. It is a if, little bit. Uh, if, they get the, if they get both policies. They're required right. to get the lender policy, but if they get the, the um, owner's policy, then they'll get a, essentially a discount of, of, for one yeah. of them. Yes. Um, you get a little break on that. Um, settlement fee, that's the closing attorneys, um, the closing attorneys charges. And then the miscellaneous charges. So homeowners association dues, prepaid dues, initiation fees, um, homeowners insurance, that all goes in that, in that section at the bottom. And then it's totaled up. Uh, so this confuses people because they subtotal each column. But then uh, and the next thing you see the due from borrower, in this case, 32,000 and change. Um, so that's what they owe, at, that's their cash to close. Um, so yeah, and then due to, is look on the seller side, due to seller. I mean, you just find the, you find the line down there um, and that shows, that shows their net. Okay, so in, in this example, I'm sorry, go ahead. You, you go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. It was just an aside. Okay, so in this example, the seller, um, let's see, due from, okay, so the buyer is going to be paying $32,103. Yep. And the seller will be receiving $31,016 and change uh, when they walk away from the closing table. That's correct. Okay. Um, this is actually a really good example of a settlement statement because it's got all kinds of stuff on here, water balances and transfer fees and all this kind of stuff. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, just, anything, anything that the seller is going to have to pay um, like that is going to show on the settlement statement. So water bills, let me just let me just talk about water bills for a second because this confuses a seller's um, it started with city of Atlanta where they passed an ordinance that says a water bill is a lien against the property. So it, that's like a tax bill. Um, so we have to pay the outstanding water bill. Um, and then a lot of cities and counties followed suit with, it, with, with city of Atlanta and have passed those ordinances. So in most Metro, um, Metro properties, we've got to collect a water bill from the seller. It's not always the final one because it takes them a few days to send it to us. Sometimes the seller makes a payment in the meantime. Um, and if they do, when they get our check, they'll kick it back to us. We'll refund it to the seller. Um, but they may still get a final water bill depending, depending on the billing cycle um, for that. And I just, I just wanna point out this part is a listing agent, if you, on that community association disclosure, if you don't, disclose, call and make sure of all these fees, these go on the seller side and they get mad at you. So just, yes, just, yes. just so, the side there. That's a great, that's a great point, Candace. So here we have an initiation fee mm -hmm. of $500, right? So under the GAR contract, let's say this, the seller didn't disclose any kind of transfer initiation charge. They, they didn't, they left it blank. They put zero in there and there's a $500 initiation fee. 
um, that would be in the seller's column. The seller would have to pay that. And the other thing I would say is it is not your responsibility to call the HOA and find that information out. Uh, you don't want that liability. You want the you want to strongly encourage your seller to call and just explain this to them and say, this could save you a whole bunch of money. Just make sure we've got all of these numbers, um, initiation fee, transfer fees, any, any other fees that could come up so that we can disclose that. So then that becomes the buyer's responsibility. Yes, yes. So, and all that's so seller. funny. I would, I would actually say the opposite. Oh, no, um, I don't want the liability for making a mistake. Right, I but to, I would call myself and check it all out. And then if oh. there was a discrepancy, then I'd tell the seller to do it. Well, yeah. So that, I, I just different. was, I've been, I've been, my finger, I've been pointed at too many times at the closing table of like, hey, here's a $250 charge and nobody wants to pay it. Oh, who are the realtors? Oh, okay, let's have them pay it. I had enough of that. Yeah. And so I probably did, uh, my, I did my job and a couple other people's jobs too. And if I found there was a discrepancy, then I encouraged my seller. Um, by the way, I was doing this before we even listed the home, right? They gave me version one of the disclosure statement, including the community stuff. And I called the HOA to confirm it all. Um, because half the time, they, they're not going to, again, I'm not saying you're obviously not saying you're wrong, Candace. It's just my, my personal preference for how, how I did it and when I did it. I wanted to... Um, I didn't want this kind of stuff to come up at the end because sometimes you can be like literally flawless until the closing table. And then like some $27, you know, nonsense fee shows up and the whole experience is ruined because of that. Even if you agree to pay for it, it's like, you just, I, I, I found that I just wanted to get that stuff out of the way early. And so when I found, uh, when I got the disclosure, I'd call the HOA and I'd confirm all that stuff. And then if there was a discrepancy, I'd, I'd uh, get the seller involved and I said, hey, looks like the transfer fee is now $400 instead of $300. Um, can we change that on the disclosure statement? I want you to be aware of, of, of that now, right? Um, and half the time, you got to understand that the HOAs, um, you know, everything is more expensive now, right? Water bills are more expensive. Maintenance projects are more expensive. And getting together a, the HOA residents to vote on uh, a, a fee increase is very unlikely. And so they have to come up with these, you know, kind of backward ways of, of getting more revenue. And a lot of times what they do is they, they, they're like, okay, well, we have a transfer fee and we have a printing fee and we have an initiation fee and we have a doc fee and we have all this, you know, bull stuff. And, not, and all this happened after the buyer bought and it wasn't the case when they bought so they're like oh there's no transfer fee for me the next thing you know there's a transfer fee and everyone's best yeah so i still i still I, sorry I i've that, got a lot i've got a lot of baggage i guess <laughs> so let's just say this one of one of my models is trust and verify so i would always want my sellers to fill out the document i would always talk to them about how important this is and how it could save them a ton of money and then I might call and verify afterwards. And of course, if they couldn't find the HOA, I would track that down and, and make sure they had the right number to call. But I would still not fill out this form and I still would not be responsible for those numbers. That would that was just me. Just like I wouldn't fill out the seller's disclosure or the lead-based paint disclosure. That's that's just something I I just feel like that's that's their that's part of their partnership in listing a home. So yeah, I would never fill it out, by the way. For trust those and verify. YouTube. All right, Karen. Enough of, enough sidebar conversation. Yeah, Take yeah. back over. No, it's it's the it, it's it's the biggest headache that we have is the HOA um, letters, and and I mean, I think that's a I, I think that's a good practice, Bill. I think you know now with a management company, I mean that's how kind of how we got here is they won't a lot a lot of times they won't talk to anybody but the seller, um, but you could be on the call with them. Um, cause a lot of times the seller yeah. doesn't know, you know, they don't realize I've had the HOAs tell the seller, oh, well, yes, you know, we charge a transfer fee and all this that you pay when you, um, pay for the closing letter, but you'll be reimbursed. Um, but that's not the case under the guard contract. Um, right. Or they'll say, well, the transfer, right fee, is, the transfer fee is $50, but we don't call it a transfer fee over here. We call it a something else fee so yeah, we didn't have to disclose that 
that what happens is they'll they'll call and they'll say, oh, well, it's a ten it's ten dollars for the letter. Well, yes, it's ten dollars for the letter, but they charge two hundred fifty dollars to get the letter. Um, and then the right. sellers like that's not what the HOA told us. And they're mad at us because they have to pay that in order to close on their property. Um, mm -hmm. so so it's, I think it's important to educate our seller. And I think I agree, Billy. It's okay. good to, to trust and verify and call. Um, I think it's important to educate our sellers about um, what to ask and how to ask. Yeah, sometimes yes. I skipped the trust part and I went straight to the verify part. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and then of I course have a question regarding the, the HOA. Uh -huh. I had a situation with Fidelity Insurance. Is there any way to find out like, if they're purchasing a condo, uh, what the requirement is from the HOA before getting like 20 days or so into it? You mean it, what the insurance coverage is and all that? Correct. Like I, I know, like a lot of people now are like saying, "Hey, it needs to be like a million, and the HOA don't cover that amount, and you know won't cooperate." Like, is it a way early that we can find it out? Right. I don't. I, you know, Marquis, I don't know that there is, because um, you know, like when. The lender, the lender, in, a, in the case of a condo, requests a condo questionnaire, which asks all those things: what the insurance coverage is, um, and th they have to pay. The buyer has to pay a fee for that, uh, and it's you know it's pretty hefty. I think um, I don't know that the that that they will give you their insurance coverage in advance. It may depend on the it may depend on the condo. So I think what happened in that situation, Marquia, was that um, the lender was probably a little. Um, we went through two lenders, though. Both lenders um, had the same requirement. So. No, no, not the not the requirements of the lender. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's the it's the um, kind of the uh, God. I don't want to. I don't know who the lender was. I don't want to say anything bad about them, but that's something they should have caught early. That's oh, not right. a that's not a closing attorney issue. Okay. Yeah, so I, the don't all, are I don't the standards see all that are, right? condo questionnaire stuff until the end. And every by the way, every lender's condo questionnaire is slightly different too. Some ask you know, what percentage of the HOA or the owners are behind in their um, uh, HOA fees, and behind in their HOA fees in some cases is thirty days, and in some cases is sixty days, in some cases is ninety days, and then. Uh, the answer, if it's 16%, they'll not do the loan. Or if it's 18%, they'll not do the loan. But if it's 14%, it's okay. I mean, I once had a seller who at the, essentially like a week before closing, couldn't close because the buyer couldn't get financing in there. We even offered to pay off the HOA debts of enough people to bring the number down. And they still said no. I, had an agent I think that you were involved that in that, if I remember correctly. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Look, go ahead. I had, a, I had an agent that did that and paid. There was like one unit that they needed to be current, so the agent paid it. <laughs> it wasn't that yeah. much money. Oh, I tried. It was like, okay, we'll pay you 200 bucks there, 300 bucks there, 150 bucks there, $600 there. Okay, we're clear. Uh -huh. They're like, you can't do that. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I've been telling too many stories today. I got to put myself on mute. <laughs> we got to make the settlement statement interesting, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Because what else should we know about story. settlement statements? And then, that? well, here's my other here's my other tip. Okay, because I mean, I've been doing this. I've been doing this like twenty years now. So I've done a lot of these closings. Uh, once you sit in enough of my closings, you'll know I say the same thing. Um, I'm going to go over the settlement statement whether somebody tells me they want to or not, or, oh, I've already seen the numbers, I'm good. Sometimes I get that. I'm gonna go over it. Um, so that's the part that you really wanna be looking at and paying attention to. Um, we're gonna do that first in the closing, just to make sure it's our one last look to make sure that everything on there is is correct. After that, um, you know, you can, you can relax. 
Um, you want to just share, uh, uh, this just popped into my mind and, and I've, I've heard and seen some pretty atrocious things at the closing table from a behavior standpoint. Um, you want to give us any, any tips on behavior at the closing table? Um, as a new agent, my biggest tip is, uh, if the buyer starts asking you questions and look, because they're going to look at you because they know you, you're their friend, you're their realtor um, about numbers or whatever. Just pause a second because I'll jump in and answer it. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, first of all, it's probably a question either for the lender or for me anyway. Um, I, let me drive the bus. And, and you really, really will relax. I mean, I'm gonna tell you what's going on. If we don't have a wire, we're closing an escrow, um, you know, just relax. The nice thing too about closing with us is, you know, you can always, if you've got questions about stuff or you, you can always call me, you can show up early to the closing. Hey, the walkthrough was terrible. They're fighting, you know, this is gonna be, and, and I'll take all that into account and have everybody thinking they're best friends by the end of the closing. Um, yeah, I've had closings where we had to separate the parties. Yes, uh, yes. Where agents, where, <laughs> oh God, I had one one time where the listing agent basically walked out on the seller and I was like, this is insane, bye. Right, right. So, you know, I'll, I, I know, you know, I, you may not even know um, the sellers are getting divorced, right? And you represent the buyer. Like, I, you know, I'm going to, I tailor my conversation at the table for what I know about the transaction. Um, so I had a seller one time, the wife did not want to sell the house. So we did not, we talked about kids and babies um, in that closing. We did not mention one thing about that house because she was not happy about that. Um, the other thing is like, um, at, we have to send funding documents. For shelter, it's, it's a closing disclosure. Um, and that's it. Some lenders, it's everything the buyer signs. So I'm going to get all that done first. And, and then I'll tell everybody what I'm doing, but I walk in and out of the closing. Wait until we have the document signed before you start engaging the seller in converse because we get to the seller part and I, I see a lot of agents that'll start asking about, you know, how the alarm system works and the lawn care. And you're going to have time um, when I get my document signed, but ultimately that's going to slow you down in getting an approval from the lender. If I've got to send those documents to the lender. So at least wait until I've done that um, before you start in on the house chit chat. Okay, um, let me, let me, try to give a little bit more context to that. So um, what she's, what Kern is saying is there's some documents that the attorney, want, or I'm sorry, that the lender wants to review signed before they fund the loan, meaning they, they send the money and they, they say, hey, we can close this transaction. So the, she's suggesting let, let's get that stuff handled at the beginning before, you know, a, a whole lot of back and forth. Um, because once those documents are signed and sent off, it takes the lending, you know, the, the, the lender and their team a, a, a bit to review those documents and, and, and say, hey, we're good here. Mm -hmm. and, a cl and a cash closing, probably about 20 to 30 minutes, right? Yes, at max. Regular max. closing, conventional loan, whatever, FHA right. loan, VA yeah. loan, you're looking at I'm, probably about an hour, a little over an probably hour. Probably about an hour, you know. Um, it's, it's the ones where we have, especially if it's like a big, out-of-state lender, some of them for funding documents, I have to upload them um, in their system. And it just goes, they go in order and it can take a while. Um, so, you know, I'll tell your buyers, you know, hey, this is, I had one, I had one um, last week where I was telling the buyer, I'm like, this is nothing to be worried about. It, this is normal. I have to upload it to their system and it's probably going to take them 45 minutes um, to give us an okay. It was lunchtime. I was like, do y'all want to go across the street and get something to eat and come back? Because um, you're probably going to head out for lunch anyway after you get done here. Um, so that's what they did. Yeah, and to Kern's point, I, I always think it's um, 
it's part of our profession to be professional at the closing table. We're excited because we're getting paid, but the transaction truly is about the seller and the buyer. So if we start chit-chatting with the other agent about our industry things and, and we're leaving them out of the conversation, it's not about us, it's about them. So we need to be there listening and silent while the, while the attorney does what they need to do. And like Kern said, if the buyer has any questions or the seller has any questions, you turn it back to them because they're the who in this situation. And, and then after it's over, you can congratulate and start, you know, you can, you can engage. Once in a while, you have a really funny agent in there and they make the closing really fun. But for the most part, it, it's, it's, it's still kind of stressful for both parties because they still don't know. They want everything signed and done. And so just, just be very aware of that, that we're still in our professional mode. Um, at the closing table. And yeah, we're and back, back when there were short sales and foreclosures everywhere, those closing tables are not a happy place, Yeah. right? The realtors oftentimes are the ones walking away with the most money. It was not, you just got to be able to read the room. Yeah, yeah. They're all pretty, I mean, it's, it's rare that I have one now that's, that's sticky. Um, but if it is, you know, communicate with us. If they do need to, you know, if they do need to sign separately, um, you know, we can do that and make it, you know, make it okay for, for y'all. I mean, usually what I do is I have one party come in earlier because if they are upset with each other, um, and then they get to closing and then nobody wants to be in the same room, um, you know, people get, people get angry about stuff, I guess. <laughs> okay. What other questions do we have? I have a question, Karen. Um, so recently on a lot of listings, they have their preferred closing attorney or say must close with when it's supposed to be the description of the buyers who they close with. But of course, being in the seller's market, we feel so inclined to put, you know, that closing attorney on the uh, purchase and sale agreement. And I just wanted to know, like, what is your advice or ethics in regards to that, um, seeing that on a lot of listings and the special remarks? Right. Um, so... I always tell people it's negotiated. Okay. So you see a lot of that, um, where, you know, they, the, they, the listing agent's going to put their preferred closing attorney. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a builder file, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to require that you close with their, their attorney. Um, but, you know, for a resale type of thing, like just, you know, ask the questions. I always tell people, if you don't know who it is, it's somebody you've never heard of, um, you know, you can always call me. Um, but yeah, I had an agent one time, I was like, yeah, well, I know that closing attorney, you know, he does a fine job, um, but his only office is, you know, way across town at the end of the month, you know, talk to the other agent. Um, and see if she'd be willing to close with us because we're right down the street. Um, you know, and then for on, on the listing side, you know, uh, I get the opposite. I get agents that will say, oh, we couldn't close with you because the buyer gets to choose. Well, it's negotiated. Um, you know, if you're on the listing side, you're probably going to counter. Um, you know, you can you can counter with us. You're not going to lose a deal, I don't think, over the closing attorney. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can, I'm always happy to talk to an agent on the other side of something too, if they, you know, um, they don't know us, they don't know me, they don't know what our fees are, um, you know, I'm happy to talk to them because I'd love to, I, you know, I'd love to have the deal. Um, but I think you'll find, especially, especially with all of our locations is that you may, you know, I have lots of agents that don't send me business directly, but they'll always close with me if, the, if they see me in a contract, if I'm on the other side. And, and I have to say, I have to say that um, it's, I've been on both sides of the table where I walk in and it's like, hi, Candace, and everybody knows you because you close there so often. And then other times when you walk into the other closing in there with the other agent going, hi, and it led credibility to the other agent. So if we can do that yes. for ourselves. It's a, yes. it's a nice thing. It, it's a nice thing to have. Yeah. Yes. That familiarity. And that's the other, here's the other big tip that I have. Um, where are your name tags to closing? Please, please, please. <laughs> like, it's great when you come see me because I know you. 
right? But on a, at the end of the month, you know, we have we may have two, we may have three closings scheduled at the same time. There's lots of people in the lobby. Um, you know, that helps the closing attorney wherever you go. Uh, it helps the receptionist know because she's seen your name on the file, but she doesn't know who you are in person. Um, and so that that helps us kind of with the flow, direct traffic. And it always, you know, if it's an agent that I don't know that's got their name tag on and I know, hey, it's, you know, this is this agent Pam, I, I don't know her. And I go out and I see Pam's name tag. I pretend like I've done 150 closings for her. Um, and that makes you that makes you all look good. And did you want to say something? Oh, you're on mute. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't notice. Yes, I'd like to say something. Forget that, just like she said, it's really about negotiating that. Most agents are going to want to control as much as the transaction as possible because it is a reflection on their service. But for you, you want to fight if you represent the buyer. You really want to, uh, let's say, be assertive when it comes to that because you'll have more access to the closing attorney. And remember that the closing attorney works closely with the lender. So that facilitates a lot of services, information, and your own uh, peace of mind in the transaction. So don't be, you know, don't be afraid of just kind of pushing a little bit because like she said, nobody's going to lose a deal over a closing attorney, but it will make a difference in your client experience ultimately, because you can tell your client that if there is a question to be a question that needs answer, you have that contact with the closing attorney and it's, it's an extension of the services that you provide. I hope that helps. Yes. Totally agree with all that. Okay, any other, any other uh, questions? Anything, anyone, um, uh, did we cover anything that was unclear today or any other things regarding closings or some statements that you'd like to bring up now? Nope. Okay, don't forget today in person, 2.30 to 3.30. Uh, Kern, thank you so much for, uh, for making this a part of your day today. Um, you're welcome back anytime you would like. And uh, thank you for all of everyone else's questions and, and stories and feedback. Um, we will see you soon. All right. Bye.